Blur filters are a key tool for designers. Blurring is intentionally used to provide a sense of depth, creating smoother gradients, making transitions. It can even be useful to remove noise or otherwise undesired parts of any given image. This tool has proven to be equally as popular as it is mysterious. The core underlying concept is incredibly simple, but it requires a lot of skill to come up with an actually useful implementation that works fast and reliably. With all that said, let's dive in. In order to try and build a blurring tool, we first have to think about what blurring means at all. We can try to define loosely what blurring is by comparing the sharp sections of this image against the blurred background produced by the camera lens. We can see that the color values are smudged, as in every color leaks to all the colors around it. The blurred filling comes from the edges dissolving into their surroundings, but the whole structure of the image is still somewhat perceivable. With that in mind, we're ready to tackle in our first blurring mode, box filter. The box filter is the easiest, simplest form of blurring. It also forms the ground for all the other kinds of filters you might find in the wild. But simply, all we need to do is to look at any given pixel and somehow mix it with its neighbors. Remember that the blur filling comes from the colors linking into each other, particularly into their surroundings. What box filtering does to leak the colors is to average them. We can just take an average of any given pixel with its surroundings. After all, colors are just numbers. Let's consider this example of a cross shape over a black background. We'll focus on this pixel, but the operation is exact same for all others. We can take all eight neighbors around our target pixel and get an average of the values. That is, add them all up and divide by the number of pixels considered. In this case, nine. This new value will be the value we use in the blurred image, in the same position we considered initially. Rinse and repeat for the rest of the pixels in our image and you got a blurry version of it. What if we need to blur the image even more? We're used to having a kind of slider that allows for fine adjustment over the blurring amount. To get such a result, we would simply increase the area considered for each pixel. Before, we just consider the immediate neighborhood, that is, all the pixels touching our target one. By considering a larger surface area, we're getting influence from more parts of the image, resulting in a stronger blur. Also, because we are considering more pixels, each pixel contributes less to the overall effect. We are dividing over a larger number since there are more pixels to consider. This brings us to a particular situation where a pixel might not have any neighbors in some direction. Think an edge pixel or even a corner one. If we try and take an average of its surroundings with any filter size, we'll fall off the image. There are several solutions to this problem. All solutions propose creating a frame around the image. That is, fake pixels help with the calculation in these edge cases. This padding will grow proportionally to the filter size we're using. They differ in what you might add as padding. Some options include adding a padding of some constant number, usually zero, repeating the edge pixel, or even taking the opposite side pixel value and adding it as padding, kind of interpreting the image as a cylinder. With the little details out of the way, we can now look into more sophisticated ways of blurring. So, what's up with the Gaussian filter? In reality, it's just a glorified box filter. Instead of taking a uniform average, where each pixel is equally as important, we're giving more importance to pixels closer to our target. This importance decays towards the further pixels with a shape that you might be familiar with, a Gaussian curve. We can compare how it looks against the box filter in our original image. We can see that the lines fade slightly more smoothly to black in comparison to the box filter, which kinda simply makes the outlines thicker but less bright. So basically we have learned that making a blur filter means to take all the pixels in any given image and mix them in some way or another with their surroundings. 
This averaging looks blurry to our eyes. But this is only half the story. This very concept can be extended quite far depending on what neighbors we choose to include in the process or what operations we decide to use. For example, what if we only considered neighbors in a line? That is, we give no importance to the up and bottom ones and great importance to left and right ones. We get direction blur. We can also achieve a similar effect by taking a vertical line rather than a horizontal line. And we can also rotate this line freely to achieve motion blur in any direction. Also, we do not need to calculate the average of the pixels. As long as we can figure out a way of converting all the pixel values into a single meaningful value to substitute it for, we have some kind of filtering. For example, we can take the median instead of the average, that is, take the center value of all the neighbors considered. This filter is particularly good in removing noise and restoring old images. We could also take the minimum value out of this, or even the maximum. This yields an interesting results where the maximum value appears to thicken any strokes that the objects may have. Incidentally, the same process to blur an image can be used to sharpen it. If we give negative importance to the pixels around it, and a lot of importance to our target pixel, this results in a sharper, cruncher version of the image. But the process is still the same, we're just giving different weights to different pixels. Now, all this is good, but this is not how professional software works. If Illustrator, Affinity Designer, or Inkscape approached it like this, it would take several minutes just to blur an image, and no one's got time for that. Making these filters fast is a key aspect of usability. The filters effectively work precisely how we just saw. They just take a ton of shortcuts in order to be more performant. So, if we think about it, the operation we just described means taking every pixel in our image and, for each one, we iterate through its neighbors, make an operation on all of them to obtain a value and place this new value in the new image. This means that for every pixel we have to make at least 9 operations. This only gets worse if we increase the blur size. We'd make 25 operations per pixel for a 5x5 neighborhood, or 49 for a 7x7 blur. To put this into perspective, if we had a tiny 100x100 image, applying a 5x5 blur would mean 2.5 million. Again, a 100x100 image is tiny. We're used to working with images in the realms of 3 to 4K in width and height, which would take us on the realms of 300 million operations. Diving into these techniques is far beyond the scope of this video. We nevertheless saw how blurring works and hopefully you'll get a better sense of what's going on next time you make that beautiful gradient for your landing page.